This video is meant to help you explore a new function. It's called the reciprocal function. So the reciprocal function is the function y is equal to 1 divided by x. And it's one of the most common rational functions. So as a review, to be a rational function, you have to be in the form of a polynomial divided by another polynomial. So I write poly over poly, that's our definition for a rational function, and this definitely qualifies. y equals 1 over x, it's one of our most common rational functions. Excuse me. So definitely a function that I'm assuming you don't have any, any background with, so we want to kind of uh, analyze it from the ground up without technology. We want to have an idea of what this function looks like. So as always, we'll begin with a table of values. Whenever we're kind of unsure about the shape of a, of a function, we'll go ahead and make a table. And you've probably been taught in the past to go ahead and begin your table from negative 2 to 2. So we'll go ahead and start there and see what happens. So when we input negative 2 for x, we get 1 divided by negative 2. In other words, our output is negative 1 half. Inputting negative 1 for x gives us 1 divided by negative 1, or just negative 1. You'll notice when we input 0, though, we have a problem. 1 divided by 0, that is undefined. How about I'll just write und right now for undefined. So something odd is happening at 0 on our graph. We're not sure what yet. We will keep going and, and analyze that. Inputting 1, 1 divided by 1 is 1, and 1 divided by 2 will give us a 1 half. So let's go ahead and plot the points that we have so far. So I'll start in the, in the positive, uh, positive quadrant. So when I inputted 1, I outputted 1. So there's 1, 1. And 2 gave us positive 1 half. And now for the negatives, negative 2 gave us negative 1 half, and negative 1 was negative 1. So we get those four points because it was undefined at 0. So this is clearly not enough information to allow us to see the shape of this graph. So we need to extend our table. So why don't we go ahead and, and continue with some more positive values, such as maybe 3, 4, and 5, and see if we can have an idea of the shape um, as x is getting larger. So inputting a 3, 1 divided by 3 would be my output, 4 would result in 1 fourth, and 5 results in 1 fifth. So let's plot those points. When I travel right 3 from the origin, I'll be up 1 third, just barely above the x-axis, and when I go right 4, I'll be at 1 fourth, an even smaller fraction, just barely above the x-axis, and right 5 puts me at 1 fifth. So now we have an idea of what's happening on the right side of this graph. You can see that these y values are getting smaller and smaller and smaller, but they're approaching zero. They never dip down in the negative. They're just going to become smaller and smaller fractions. For example, if I were to input, say, positive 100, then my output would be 1 divided by 100. This very, very small, tiny, uh, positive number, but a very small number. Now, what would happen if I had inputted negative values? Very quickly, we can adjust our table here. If it had been negative 2, negative 3, negative 4, negative 5, or even negative 100, how does that impact my y value? Well, I'm just going to have the opposite here. Instead of 1 half, I have negative 1 half, negative 1 third, negative 1 fourth, and negative 1 divided by 100. So let's plot those points. So negative 2, go left 2, and down 1 half. Excuse me, we already had that one. Try again, left 3, down 1 third, about there. Left 4, down 1 fourth, just barely under the x-axis. Left 5, down 1 fifth, and if you can imagine left 100, you'd be going just barely down to 1 one hundredth. So now we have an idea of the left-hand side, its shape. This graph is going to come from below. It's going to go very, very, very close to the x-axis. It's going to hug it, but never actually intersect or cross it. So what's left to analyze is what's happening here in, the, uh, in this middle region of the graph. So let me clear out my table. For you, I just would recommend extending your table. We're going to put some more values in it. You could even make it a second table if you felt you were running out of room. So if we're interested in what's happening here in this middle section of the graph, then I'm going to need to look at some fractions, some values between 0 and 1 and between 0 and negative 1. 
Let me look at the positives first. So maybe I'm interested in uh, an x value, of, let's say, of 1 half, and then a smaller x value, 1 third, 1 fourth, and so on. So let's do this computation. If I input 1 half for x, I have 1 divided by 1 half. So this is called a complex fraction. You could write it this way. Same thing as writing 1 divided by, with our division symbol, 1 half which we know we can change our division into multiplication. We can multiply by the reciprocal of 1 half, which would be just 2 or 2 over 1. So we see that our output, our y value, is going to be just positive 2. When you input 1 half, you're going to output, output a positive 2. So let's do that one more time to make sure it makes sense to you when we input 1 third. So 1 divided by 1 third, again, complex fraction, we could rewrite it as 1 divided by, with the division sign, 1 third, which would be the same as 1 times the reciprocal of 1 third, or 1 times 3, which gives you 3. And you can probably imagine then what's going to happen when I input 1 fourth. My output will be 4. And notice as you're looking at these, these values in the table, hopefully you're starting to see, no matter what I input, the output is going to be its reciprocal. Hence the name of this function, the reciprocal function. So let's plot those points. So when I am going to the right one half from the origin, my y value is positive two. Right one third, my y value is positive three, and right one fourth, my positive or my y value is positive four. So you can imagine if I use that example like I did last time, with instead of one hundred, let's input one over one hundred, then my output would be positive one hundred. So from the origin, if I went to the right just a little bit, my y value would be huge, which tells us the behavior here that these y values, let me try that again for you, these y values are getting larger and larger and larger and larger as x gets closer and closer and closer to zero. And then once again, if we were to change these values to be negative, input negative x values, then my outputs would just be the opposite, they'd be negatives. So we can see plotting those points, negative one half pushes us down to negative two, negative one third would be down at negative three, and negative one fourth would be down at negative four, and so on. So we can complete the other portion of the graph. It looks something like this. So this is our reciprocal function. Now let's take a look at the end behavior of this function. You'll notice the end behavior is very different than the end behavior on previous functions we looked at. For example, we've looked at polynomials, such as lines and parabolas, or S-shaped curves, cubics. And you'll notice the end behavior on these polynomials, the ends of the graph are either rising or they're falling. Those are the only two options for our, our end behavior on the polynomials. However, the end behavior for this rational graph, y equals 1 over x, is very different. Take a look at the left-hand side. So left-hand side, we're taking a look here at this portion, the left-hand branch, specifically the far left side of that branch. So if we were to be pretend like you're an ant traveling along this branch, I'm traveling here to the left, we would write that movement this way. We can say, as x approaches negative infinity, and we use this arrow notation, for the word approaches, as x approaches negative infinity, meaning as we travel to the left on this particular curve. So now what's happening to these y values? Once again with the, the ant analogy, if you're an ant here, what's happening to the y values each time? Well, your y values are getting larger, but they're not getting infinitely larger. They're getting larger and approaching zero. So we write as x approaches negative infinity, the y values of this curve approach zero. Now, same thing, let's analyze the right-hand side, the right-hand side of our curve. So if we're an ant traveling to the right, then that would mean that my x values are getting larger as x approaches positive infinity. So here's my motion. If I'm an ant, I'm traveling along the curve. Here I am traveling to the right. What's happening to my y values? Well, these y values are getting smaller and smaller, but again, they're not going negative. They're getting smaller and smaller, approaching zero. So we write as x approaches infinity, the y values approach zero. And that's our end behavior, much different than the end behavior we saw with some of the other functions. 
So, what does this end behavior actually tell us about the graph? The fact that my end behavior here, the y values are approaching zero, that tells us that this particular graph has a horizontal asymptote. A horizontal asymptote. So this is an imaginary line, if you will. I always graph them in a different color. Highlighters work really nicely for, uh, for asymptotes. It's this whole imaginary horizontal line that the graph gets very, very, very close to. In this case, it's hugging, think of the two branches, it hugs this horizontal line, but it doesn't actually intersect it in this case. That's my horizontal asymptote. So the equation for the horizontal asymptote would be the horizontal line y is equal to 0. So the graph of y equals 1 over x has a horizontal asymptote. But then if you take a look at the middle of the graph, you may notice that the two branches also hug the y-axis. So we also have this imaginary line that's vertical that the graph is getting very, very close to. And again, not intersecting. So that means that we also have a vertical asymptote. So two characteristics of this particular function is that it has a horizontal and a vertical asymptote. And the equation for this vertical asymptote would be the vertical line x is equal to 0. And then we might also notice that there is some symmetry here um, in this function. We've talked about two different types of symmetry, where you can fold the function over the y-axis. That would be um, symmetry with the y-axis. Those are even functions. And symmetry where you can rotate the function around the origin and have what we call origin symmetry, and those functions are odd functions. So hopefully you can see that for this example, you certainly can take this branch here in the first quadrant, and if you were to rotate it around 180 degrees, indeed you would get the resulting mirror image branch that's down in the third quadrant. So that means we do have symmetry. This particular function is an example of an odd function. It's an odd function which means that it has origin symmetry. And that's confirmed in our table. And if you had, in fact, thought about that initially, that would have saved you some time graphing the function because if you know it has this type of symmetry, then you just need to be graphing, let's say, the positive portion, and then you'll be able to use that rotational symmetry to graph the other branch, the other branch. So here's our reciprocal function. Main big ideas that you need to remember. It has a horizontal asymptote, y equals 0, a vertical asymptote, x equals 0, it is an odd function, and it also has a domain restriction because the denominator cannot be equal to zero. So the domain would be all real numbers except for zero.